You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Welcome along to the Straight to Video Podcast. Hope everyone is doing great out there. As always, I'm your host, Rob Lane, and want to thank you for checking out the show. This is episode 64, no less. Wow, we're racking them up with no sign of stopping just yet. Today, thanks to my friend Ben Christo, I got the chance to talk to Michael McKeegan, who is the bass player for legendary alternative rock and metal band The Mighty Therapy. Now, Therapy are one of those bands that exploded onto the rock and metal scene right at the time when I was fully immersing myself into music. I was coming out of my teens and into my 20s and music was pretty much all I cared about. Buying albums, going to gigs, learning the bass. And then this band from Northern Ireland comes along with the song Screamager, which dominates the charts and also dance floors of rock clubs. And much like Nirvana a few years earlier, even though it wasn't the music I was necessarily listening to, I was like, wow, this really is something special. I think it was fairly evident from the beginning that Therapy would be a band that wasn't going to go away. Their DIY ethic and honest, original songwriting was something that could bypass trends and span several decades. In fact, the band have recently celebrated their 30th anniversary with a new re-recorded Greatest Hits album available on Marshall Records, and they also have a biography called So Much for the 30-Year Plan by Simon Young, which is available through Jawbone Press. Also, for those wanting to get their hands on some 90s gold, then Music on Vinyl have done a vinyl reissue of the classic Troublegum album. For more info on all this, you can visit therapyquestionmark.co.uk. Michael was a lot of fun to talk to. We discussed his childhood in Larne County Antrim and our mutual love of old VHS horror movies, along with the early days of the band and also touch on their tour with local Derby heroes The Beyond from the 90s and how they ended up recruiting their drummer Neil Cooper many years after their first tour together. I think you'll have fun with this chat, so please sit back and enjoy my straight-to-video talk with Therapy's Michael McKeegan. Is it Larne in County Antrim you're from originally? Larne in County Antrim, yes. Just I grew up maybe f- five miles from here in a little country village and then um, lived in various places over the years and now, you know, came back here about maybe, of course, maybe even 15 years ago. So to start a family and stuff. So we've been here. Is that kind of where your formative years were in Larne? Very much so. This is where we would have got into trouble and went out and, you know, kind of went to school here, obviously, as well, you know. So we definitely spent the first 18 years of my life here. And is it two brothers you've got? Is it Charlie and Kieran? Two brothers, Charlie and Kieran, yeah. Elder brother, younger brother. So, like I said, growing up in the country, you know, you had to make your own fun. It is the old cliche. So we all kind of get into music and being in bands at the same time. So we always kind of had it. We always kind of had a wee band together, you know, from maybe, I think maybe age 11, 12, we were getting into music. So it was fortuitous. There was three of us, you know, so there's someone wanted to play drums. Two of us wanted to play guitar. So in the end, I I played bass to make the band work, if you know what I mean. How was it like being the middle child? I don't know. You know, it's kind of obviously, you know, my elder brother, he kind of forged the way and a lot of things he would have you know we all went to the same school so by the time I got to that the the secondary school he kind of 
you know, you, you'd kind of the respect or at least the awareness of the peers and stuff. So it wasn't probably quite so intimidating. And, you know, I, I quite enjoyed school. I wasn't a particularly, you know, A plus student or anything like that, but I, I kind of enjoyed it on the social aspect. And we always did all right, you know, and, and got by and stuff, you know, so it was it was good. I quite enjoyed it. And it was good. You know, it's a nice, nice time getting into music then. And it was, I suppose that was the start of the 80s. Through the 80s, there was a really exciting time for music, lots of different kind of, at the time, new, so was the new wave of British heavy metal had just kind of kicked in. So sort of the second wave of punk was happening, post-punk, and then on through that decade, you would have got thrash metal going into death metal, the rise of, I suppose, electronic music, acid house and stuff like that, and then alternative music to then the 80s coming into, I suppose, grunge and post-grunge and whatever, and a lot of good stuff going on. We were very invested in a lot of the music scenes. Around that time, kind of everything kind of changed every couple of years, really. Like you say, there was like different waves of stuff coming in, like constantly exciting stuff. It didn't kind of get stagnant for an extended period of time. There was always something around the corner, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a crazy time. And I suppose another good thing about being one of the three brothers, similar in age, you know, we're all into the same kind of music and the same kind of movies and you all got into sci-fi and horror movies and it was a bit of a golden age for that kind of stuff as well so we you've got the how do you put it the spending power of of three teenagers that is true yeah you know as opposed to one so you could pull your resources and you know you could um access a lot more stuff because those were the days of lauren had a record shop you had to order stuff in but that was really a case of you had to get a bus to belfast on a saturday and really you know budgeted for what you're going to buy and if you got there too late you know one of the three copies of the new slayer album had gone at that stage so you were you know up against it so it was um yeah it was good i never actually thought about it, but the spending power of the three that's great yeah because normally you'd have like an extended period oh, i'll buy this album this week and then i've got to wait like six weeks to save up for the next one but then of course you know that led to all sorts of hassle later on fighting over the original copy of killers or number of the beast but i paid three quid for that (laughs) (laughs) so i think we're only like a couple of years difference in age so like you say we probably grew up watching kind of similar things so you mentioned sci-fi and horror was star wars a big deal for you you couldn't kind of escape it in the late 70s and 80s star wars wasn't i didn't really get into star wars it's bizarre because i'm I'm of the perfect age you know where where it should have been a, a much bigger thing for me wasn't really. I don't think I really sat down and watched them properly until possibly the early nineties. This is I know this is probably like sh- should not be admitted. We were maybe more into like I suppose like the Evil Dead was a big one in our house and the so called video nasties at the time and getting into stuff like that and kind of I don't know Star Wars almost seemed a, a little bit not for kids because I know it is obviously for kids of all ages but. I think we just kind of just seemed to skip that and went, I don't know, we, we just went, maybe we went to kind of the 18 plus horrors when we were about. Yeah. It's crazy when I think on it, you know, going into Michael Roy's video and Lauren and they had a very good selection of, you know, gore movies and the video nasties and stuff. And, you know, even things like Shogun Assassin and those kind of bizarre kind of like very, very explicit gory kind of, you know, martial arts type things as well. We were watching all that, which is crazy. So it was kind of, For me, a lot of that imagery and, you know, kind of I went more hand in hand, you know, with I suppose the metal stuff and getting into thrash, thrash metal, nuclear assault, post-apocalyptic stuff, gore, all that kind of thing. Would they actually let you rent out those kind of films from the video shop? Well, they would because the guy that ran it knew knew my mum, you know, so. I I think that was a thing. As long as the parents said, yeah, let him rent whatever he wants. That's what it was. And that's just what you did. And it's crazy now when you think on it, you know, what I was just talking to the other guys in the band I'd seen in my local ads. I spit on your grave blu-ray special edition and I was like wow <laughs> in Asda that amazing. was like <laughs> yeah in Asda you just sat there right at the you know the kind of the concessions and I was like wow back in the day that was like the most forbidden of the forbidden yeah. it's funny and it's sad as well because you know that the, the whole video nasties hysteria and all that how people went to jail yeah people's lives were ruined you know and and now you can stream any of these movies you can buy them in Asda in, in the deluxe remastered 4k version it's it's mad to look back and it probably you know i'm obviously show my age here and stuff but it's it's funny to think like pre-internet and and pre you know maybe the the mid to late 90s this kind of stuff you just couldn't get your hands on which in a way 
might explain a lot of probably people our age is obsessive kind of you know dedication to obscure music and art and movies and stuff you really had to struggle to see that stuff or listen to that stuff and track it down so <laughs> yes you, <laughs> it was always a bit a bit of a you had to really work for yeah. it you know so uh and it's good i don't think i saw texas chainsaw massacre until crikey when would it be i've got family in the states and that never got banned over there so when we went into the video store over there they had it and it took me like a few weeks to kind of oh wow i was actually scared like this is like a dangerous film but yeah it eventually plucked <laughs> up enough courage to rent it and still a great film still a great film it is good actually it's, i've actually um i enjoy it more with being a bit older i think at the time we were maybe expect more of a gory cheap thrills but it's um it's a very claustrophobic menacing movie when when you get onto the bonnet and i went to um this is maybe 15 years ago there's a cinema version doing the rounds and i went up to watch it in belfast and it was me and two guys in the cinema completely empty apart from that and i'd never really heard it at volume the sound design on it is incredible there's all sorts of weird creaks and rumblings and stuff that you would never hear on a, a third copy vhs that you're watching you know, at midnight, but it was, it's a really um, crazy piece of work, you know, very, stays with you actually yeah. a lot of, a lot of the scenes and stuff. And not particularly gory, really. No, not, not at all. I think that the title kind of did a, a disservice. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it still has that element, even though you don't really see much, it is still like almost look through your fingers kind of stuff, even though it's not there on screen. It's ever so good how they do it really is. Obviously such a, a low budget effort as well, but it's, it's really well shot. And I think it's like those kind of, things as well with it it's a pity that something like that would get lumped together with a more obvious slasher that was just cheap flicks and just you know just for cheap kicks and kind of just banned out right you know i think that was with that kind of censorship from the bbfc at the time it it, it was very broad strokes you know what i mean it was just like ban this filth that was it right across the board (laughs) i don't think they probably even watched most of them they just saw the title and that was it done yeah read a brief synopsis chainsaw wielding mania all right okay (laughs) is there any films you rented which perhaps people wouldn't know because i always have these films which i think everybody knows about because it was a big deal in the vhs shop but then you get speaking to somebody 30 years later like i've never even heard of that film there's all these weird ones like don't go in the basement and there were there's definitely like an, an I suppose an A, B, C and D list of, of the horror ones you know and a lot of them you know were obviously repurposed kind of bits of other movies put together and re-edited and, and obviously to capitalise on the things but Shogun Assassin I always remember was an interesting one because it's apparently three quite famous samurai movies that are kind of westerns but it's been bad it's a, it's a weirdly edited movie and I think it's been edited together apparently from three movies that were possibly a trilogy but it's been put into one for a Western release. And that was always one we like watching. There's also, I just remember, it wasn't really a Nazi, Zoltan, Hound of Dracula. Right. I think it might have been out of the Hammer stable. And we watched that and it's basically a dog who's, it's the devil's dog, basically. And it, it was a one we, we saw quite early on was quite scary. You know, stayed with you. And even things like Race with the Devil. I don't know that one. It's really good. It's kind of, I can't actually remember who's in it. It might even be Peter Fonda. Basically a family go out into the middle of the desert in an RV to have a good time and disturb some devil worshippers. And then they are basically chased by these devil worshippers. But it's kind of got that classic paranoia where every truck stop they stop at. You're not really aware of who was one of the mass devil worshippers. It's really good, actually, Race with the Devil. It's... It's a bit of a classic, actually. Do you kind of stay on top of horror films? Do you still watch them to this day? When I can, you know, I think like a lot of the gory stuff, you know, I'm not really into as much to as, as you are when you're 14 or 15, <laughs> you know. But um, obviously a big, big Stephen King fan, yep. big John Carpenter fan. Which do you think is some of King's best film adaptations? Because it's a bit hit and miss. I wasn't that keen on the new It movies, I thought the um, the TV seri- series was a lot better. And I'm really interested in seeing, of course, I've forgotten the name of it, the book that was out recently. I can't keep up with Stephen King's books. Every time I go into a shop, there's like a brand new one. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> His output is insane, and I think there's been so many kind of adaptations and revisitations, and and you know you got the Castle Rock thing, and you know the, the Shining, and then there's there was that kind of the sequel to the Shining that came out that was you know so there's all there's a lot going on there. But obviously, you know, I, I grew up reading Stephen yeah. King, so I'm always interested to see what he's up to. There's a version of The Stand, I believe, doing the rounds, which I haven't looked into yet. The best kind of horror 
movie I've seen recently is that one Host oh it's great yeah really really good you enjoy that yeah 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 that was a recommendation from Neil our drummer there was just something about it I just thought it was brilliant because I thought the cast were brilliant they were all really believable Mm -hmm. you know even that really annoying guy that kind of gets his comeuppance in it but it's good and it's short. I think it's the, actually the length of a Zoom call, isn't it? The kind of what they say is the maximum length. Very good. Uh-huh. Really clever. I what, what like that. And I've been reading about this new one, Sensor. Right, I've not heard of that. Uh, Michael Smiley's in it. There's a few ones. It's basically based around the premise as I read it was she's a film censor in the 80s and she has to watch and rate a movie. The premise of it is very similar to something, a trauma she suffered in the past. Ah, right. And it starts up a whole thing. As I was reading that, it was just taking all those boxes, 80s, film <laughs> censors, Michael Smiley being yeah. creepy. Wicked. You know, so uh, it, it sounds great. So I'm definitely going to be uh, checking that one out soon. So where did kind of music open the door for you? What was, can you remember the first bands which kind of blew your mind? It was probably ACDC. Yeah? Yeah, ACDC were definitely the big kind of, oh my God, I've never heard anything like this before and I love it. You know, that was... A few friends, older brothers, they were into ACDC. And I remember we were up, they had a garage with a pool table in it, you know, and we were just going to hang out there and they would play music. And ACDC was, they just played it all the time. I think this was possibly how the hell was what they got up to. Because I remember getting back in black when it came out. Obviously, Bon Scott passing was, you know, major news in the scene there as well. Very sad. So it was definitely DC. And then from that, I suppose Iron Maiden, then Lizzie, Black Sabbath. Actually, Aussie, we actually started on Aussie first. Yeah. And then kind of worked back into Sabbath, Talk of the Devil or Speak of the Devil. I did that with Van Halen. I started with David Lee Roth and went backwards. <laughs> kind of a light version, but yeah, that was my entry into all that. Hey, and you good? It's, it's, it's interesting, those end points. And, and Thin Lizzy actually split up when I get into Right. Them. I'd never seen Phil in it live in concert which is kind of one of my big, big bands of my existence. <laughs> you know, even if it had been like one year earlier, yeah, it was Thunder and Lightning, I get into them. And then obviously they, that was kind of their farewell turn. That was it, you know, so it just didn't happen. So those kind of like classic rock things. And then from that, you pick up and stuff. And obviously you're reading Kerrang! magazine and you would hear about Accept and mm-hmm. Raven and, you know, Venom and stuff like that. And then that was logical just to lead into Metallica and suppose the thrash bands that were coming then 83, 84. And one other good thing as well was Northern Ireland, you know, being quite small, there wasn't a huge metal scene or a huge punk scene. Everyone who was kind of a bit busy, anyone who didn't just listen to pop music, or whatever, kind of banded together. Right. So the goths would be friends with the punks and the metalers, and we would all kind of swap records and go to gigs, nice. so, which was brilliant. You know, they all kind of joined together and merged and no boundaries or anything. You'd go to someone's house and they'd be playing the Dead Kennedys and then Sisters of Mercy or, you know, whatever, a bit of creator. So it's, it's all kind of a good mix. And then you, you would tend to go to the concerts because there weren't that many concerts either. So if... Susie and the Banshees played, you'd all go and see them. If the Stranglers played, you'd go and see them. If Metallica played, you'd all go and see them. So it was healthy in that respect. It was it was a good way to kind of be exposed to a lot of stuff, purely because there wasn't that much stuff to consume. So you took it where you got it, really. And how old would you be at this time? Or is this kind of over a period of years? 83, I suppose, let me think. Probably when I went to secondary school, because that's when you started making a wider group of friends from around the neighbourhood. And you would have been, you know, inclined to go up to Belfast to do stuff. So probably from, say, 13 to 18. Yeah. 83 up to 1990, you know. So at what point did you decide to form the band with your brothers? We kind of had messing about bands since we were about 11, well, since I was about 11 or 12 so we were always doing stuff and as I said I, I was the bass player so we kind of did things and we had a kind of like a couple of metal bands and then we got really into I suppose like the death metal like kind of the early death metal things so we it was more about thrashy death metal we had a band called Evil Priest we did a couple of demos with them literally three or four gigs and then at that time I was with at school with Fife the original therapy drummer he was in another band but he just met Andy and they'd formed a band together and did the first therapy demo. Did I read that Andy actually borrowed your bass to record the bass? He did actually, yes. So I'm I was there in spirit with my my white Marlin PBS copy. <laughs> was that your first bass? It was actually my first bass, literally my first bass. That was great. And then when I heard it, I just loved it. I was just like, oh my God, this is it had that kind of punk ferocity but it had riffs and it was also melodic so there was just a lot a lot of really exciting elements in there that I loved so I was I was just thought this is amazing this is this is brilliant this is so good and it was way above the level of anything you know either 
songwriting or, or recording wise I'd heard from any bands locally it was it didn't sound like a local band so I was writing board from the start and then they had a gig booked and they needed a bass player so I just went up and started <laughs> yeah exactly I I can do it I can do it so uh, and that was it that was 19 sort of 1989 actually very cool how was your first recording experiences with Evil Priest? You know, that was four track in the in the garage territory. We never actually made it into a professional studio, which was, you know, at that stage, it had kind of, I suppose it had run its course, you know, everyone was kind of off doing their own things. And the therapy thing was just a lot more exciting for me. Yeah. Where did they record that at? I think the first demo, they just did up in a little kind of studio up somewhere in Belfast in a little attic studio some guy had up there. Same when we went to a proper studio, which ironically doesn't sound as good as the first demo. It sounded a bit too clean, actually. I don't know what right. it was. I think maybe we were got red light fever. You know, when you see more salubrious surroundings and a bigger mixing desk, you think, uh oh, the energy isn't as ferocious as on the first one. But then these are all, this is why you do demos. <laughs> yeah. So you can <laughs> learn as you go along. It's like, I will never do that again. <laughs> Did your brothers carry on doing music? My brother Charlie, the drummer, he um he had a band called LMS for a while and they did like a like a wee mini album and they would have toured a bit and stuff. I've actually just as part of my what do you do in lockdown routine, I've been kind of sorting out stuff around the house and I found a load of their old t shirts and oh wow posters of his. I'm sending them up to him because you know, they're just sitting in my attic now, you know. But they, you know, they supported the Manic Street Preachers and a, a wee tour of Ireland and yeah. stuff and they John Peel would have played them and stuff. So they, they did a few bits and pieces. He's he's a great drummer. He's actually um, filled in for therapy a couple of times. Oh, nice! Once when Graham broke his arm, and once when Neil actually broke his arm. So he's he was the super sub a few times. Excellent stuff. So when you kind of joined therapy around 1989, was that just as you were kind of leaving school, or had you left school? Just leaving school, or that was the tail end of my last kind of term. You know, that that summer, which was obviously it was kind of thinking of the time and it couldn't have been better obviously you don't know what's going to happen but Mm -hmm. you're in the band then that summer we did the second demo we started getting gigs and then we recorded the the first single it would have been the end of 89 going into 90 so that was all very um you know it was always it was quite a natural flow you know all of a sudden you're in a band and you've got kind of free time and opportunities start to pop up and those opportunities begat other opportunities so it was there was no you know as we always joke there's there was no plan you know it was just things kind of happened and there's a bit of a sea change coming with the music scene and there was a lot of exciting stuff going on and we slotted into what people wanted to hear at that time. How was that decision for you then, leaving school and going into the band? Was college ever an option for you or was you just going like, right, I'm just going to ride this out, this is an opportunity, at least ride it out for a few years and see what happens or was there any kind of thinking behind that? I was going to go to college but then it was kind of, I think I actually did go for bits of the first term but then the band thing just kind of took off. So I wouldn't say immediately, but it was just such a steady build. And that's what excited me about it. And I think the fact that we, you know, we would have rehearsed three times a week, gigs at the weekend, you're doing the demos, you're mailing them out, you're getting on top of stuff, you're, you know, chasing up gigs and stuff like that. It, It was nearly almost like a full time job from the start. And then you'd start doing tours. And I think we were the, I think there was possibly a mindset of, because there wasn't really a music scene in Northern Ireland at all. Right. You know, there was kind of a bit of a post U2, wouldn't say hangover, but it was all very Dublin centric. And we were just, we we weren't even accepted in Belfast, let alone, you know, in the quarters of power in the music business in Dublin. We were like outsiders nearly twice removed because we were from like Lauren and Ballyclare. So it was a case of, well, they're not going to do it. So why don't we do it? So we'll just learn how to do that and we'll ring up people and we'll make mistakes and we'll we'll do the artwork and we'll do this and we just kind of went for it. And I think the fact that being from Northern Ireland and the, there were so few kind of opportunities for bands, some be like, oh, do you want to come and play in a boxing club in Dundalk? We'll do it. You know what I mean? And then you want to play a biker festival in Waterford? Don't know how we're going to get there. We'll do it. There was a can-do attitude, a DIY can-do attitude. And I think we kind of massively benefited from it right over the last 30 years, you know, because when all else fails, you think, well, you know, I'm sure we can work this out one way or another. It's a perfect almost training ground for how the industry has become in the last, I don't know how many years you want to say, last seven or eight years, where it has almost given bands the opportunity to go DIY again and do things off their own back. So you had that perfect training ground in the early days so you can just revert back to it. Absolutely. And and I think you've got better, a lot better tools and a lot better reach. Obviously, there's 
there's elements of back then that were, I wouldn't say better, but they were different in a way. But you just you just adapt and grow with it, you know. And I think because we come from that pre-internet, pre-mobile phone, get in the van kind of mindset, that's stood us in good stead. Because then when you, you kind of see these new technologies and new things, you can cherry pick them in a way that is compatible with the way we like to do things or we like to present ourselves. And that's important as well you know i've had so many conversations with people about how did we used to tour 15 years ago before sat navs and <laughs> back then i think the first major breakthrough was where you printed out the root finders and if you took one wrong turn you were screwed because it messed the whole thing up <laughs> was it? yeah yeah oh and then the, yeah the, the bag of change for your payphone and you know the amount of times you you'd finally find a payphone to ring the promoter to say you were late and get directions and you know be ripped up receivers ripped off the wall and it's just battered it's like oh no god no you know i don't think i think maybe two gigs out of every three we didn't even sound check because we literally arrived put the gear up throw and go some food and play yeah it was it was crazy but you know character building (laughs) was andy working pretty much full time when you started i read something about he'd work a full day shift and then drive straight to a gig yeah, he he a he a crazy schedule. He he was working uh, in Michelin tires up in Palomina, and that was shift work as well. So a lot of times, you know, he'd be playing gigs, driving back to go in to work wow. through the night, or you know, do a shift, a night shift, get in, get a few hours, and then come to practice in the afternoon. Yeah, to then have to go back in that evening. So that was particularly grueling. And at the time, you know, Andy was the only one that had a car. So he was the driver as well. So I really don't know how he did it. You know, I kind of, I got off all right, you know, sitting in in the back, trying to read the map, (laughs) giving out bad direction advice or whatever, you know. But it was good because everyone kind of, I suppose, fell into their own little roles within the band. They get kind of tight as a unit, Mm -hmm. you know, and and, and we were very, very lucky in that. And, And fair play to Andy, you know, it was he was the one that made it all work around his crazy schedules, you know, and and obviously that income was very important when you're trying to book studio time and, and pay for postage, you know, to get demos and stuff out there. So The whole work and gig mindset is something you have for probably about 10 years or so. I used to do that all the time, but I couldn't do it now. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a tipping point, isn't there? Yeah, where the mind and the body just kind of screw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just got to sit down for a minute. So was your like first, I don't want to say proper tour, but one of the first tours you did was with The Beyond. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I came across The Beyond through um, just tape trading. Right. Okay. And they were one of the more interesting bands than myself and, and, and Andy had thought at the time, just because I suppose that, what, maybe 89, 90, well, yeah, 88, 89, there was a lot of post-Metallica thrash bands everyone was in a thrash band but quite generic and at that stage we'd already moved on into like death metal and you know a lot more noisier stuff and the beyond were kind of kindred spirits i thought musically just because they obviously had a bit of a, a broader range of influences than just metallic and anthrax and they were obviously into acid house so i think i i would write to neil and we would just you know they would swap demos and, and do that usual thing and then when we did the single we'd send them a, an advanced copy of it and say look we've got the single coming out and they said well that's really cool because we're actually doing a bit of a tour we've got our single out first dps coming out and on uh, big cat records so fair play they they just said come over so we got in the the big rusty van and went over and it was probably maybe 10 shows or whatever but we, we kicked off and went around and we, we did tj's on our own down in newport and then we drove up and did obviously like nottingham derby Newcastle. I'm from just outside Derby. I just wondered if you did a, a Derby show because that was their kind of hometown. Yeah, we did the, the Rock House with the Mango was. Oh, nice. Yeah, we did that, and that was that was great. And just you know, we got on really well, and you know, we all like the Dead Kennedys, but we also liked Acid House, and we also liked Early Metallica and Slayer, and they, they were a great bunch of lads, and we good fun with them. So that was really really good, you know. So that was definitely our first experience of kind of being outside. That was our first time outside Ireland, and it was it was really cool that. You know, there was a band like The Beyond that kind of seemed to want to do something slightly different, you know, but in a different way to what how we wanted to do something slightly different, if that makes sense. And you certainly kept hold of Neil's telephone number. <laughs> well, we didn't. No? Oh, was, okay. <laughs> that was the ironic thing. That whole, um, we had kind of lost contact. We had lost contact probably 
maybe like mid 90s. It was only really totally by chance. Andy went to uh, see uh, Rival Schools, the band yep. in London. They were doing a London show. And uh, for some reason, I, I stayed, we, I was staying at his house just outside London and he went into the gig and I stayed. And the next morning, he says, you'll never guess who I met at Rival Schools. I was like, well, I don't think it's bad, blasphemous. Neil Cooper, remember Neil Cooper? He literally bumped into Neil at the bar. It might have been Yulu where the show was. So he bumped into Neil and Graham, our drummer, had just left. So we were kind of, me and Andy were just kind of writing some new stuff at the minute and pouring about. And, and they just got chatting and he, and he said, look, we're actually, well, here's my number, you know, if you need someone to come and play drums. So yet again, it was just one of those very kind of easy, you know, no audition, no, none of that nonsense, you know, and it just it just felt right. And then I was thinking, I was going, well, he was a great drummer. And I remember um, Fife, our original drummer, he loved Neil's drumming. So it was almost like Neil was nearly an influence on, yeah. on Fife. And then it was bizarre that now there was an opportunity for Neil to play with us. So it was really exciting and you couldn't, I would never have thought of him in a million years just because he was off our radar. And, and I think we probably would have looked at a more rock, rock drummer mm-hmm. or someone that had been in a name band, you know, very recently, you know, so it's just like, this is great. And obviously, you know, Neil, like ourselves, comes from that kind of get in the van do it yourself he's mm-hmm. got good ideas and he's proactive and it just fit our mindset yeah you probably know when someone in your band's into it you, there's this kind of cheerleading mode you have to go into and it's exhausting it's exhausting you get to the point where it's like i can't do this anymore i'm not going to try and g up to do something if you don't want to do it so that was a really good that's what i really see as the proper starting point of kind of the resurgence of therapy getting us back on track musically and kind of even mindset wise or, or and, and reconsolidating the strengths of the band and being positive and not moaning about stuff just because you can't get ciabatta bread that day or something whatever <laughs> did i get right it's when you said you first started out you kind of didn't really fit in anywhere yeah i think you know at the time a lot of metal of metal and punk had become a, maybe a bit not stereotypical but there was almost like a formula to do it there's a lot of bands you know in ireland i suppose at the time when we started it was everyone looked and sounded like you two or everyone looked and sounded like guns and roses and then it was coming up you know this whole metallica thing where it was these identical looks and sounds and you know i like early u2 mm-hmm. I like guns and roses i like metallica but i never wanted to sound like them do you know what i mean there's obviously elements of probably you can people can hear elements of all three of those in there they were never really huge influences but then when you bring in all these things it's like well i like the dead kennedys and i like acid house beats and i like craft work but also like god flesh and also like the descendants and his do so is there a way that this can all work together? And bizarrely, there seemed to be a way we could do that. And and sometimes it it veers more towards metal or punk or there's a more industrial or dubby edge to stuff, but it's kind of just how you kind of come at it and how you're feeling. And that's in a lot of ways a massive strength for the band. But in some ways, people aren't really sure about it. People are always obsessed with is it metal? What genre is I'm going, well, I don't really know. There's elements of that. And then it's kind of, it's not really for me to to decide because I hear people say, oh, that I love that song. It reminds me of a Hawkwind song. And then someone goes, I love that song. Or it reminds me of Nick yeah. Cave. And I'm going, <laughs> how can all these elements coexist within the band? But they seem to, and people get different things. And I think also as well, lyrically, Andy spends a lot of time in the lyrics and I think a lot of bands, well, I know a lot of the bands who will tell me that they don't spend any time in the lyrics at all. And I think especially even more so back then, there was a lot of cliches and there was all these blues scales, guitar solos things. And it's like, well, why don't we just do some more like Captain Beefheart or an atonal thing or a sonic youth thing over a Metallica riff? It doesn't have to be this perfect pentatonic blues. You know, mix it up. And, and also with the lyrics, why would you have to deal in, in cliches or deal in things like that? And sometimes it's not very obvious what are going on either musically or lyrically. But I think that then lets people decide or the listener decide, well, this means that or it means to me. And it it keeps it a bit more open to interpretation musically and lyrically. So it's it's good. And I think you have to have that. We're a bit more comfortable in our skin, definitely in the last 10 years, especially. But probably since Neil joined, it's like, if it feels good, we'll play it. You know, we did get into a period of overanalyzing and there was more talking in the practice room than actually playing, which is, as you know, is is a kiss of death. <laughs> yeah, it's before you finish the riff, 
Someone's going, well, it's a bit too Sabbath. <laughs> I'm like, is there such a thing as too Sabbath? Surely that's a good thing. But uh, ideas wouldn't even really be allowed to or get to, to a point where you could then decide whether you like them or not. So we, we, we've been a bit more, I suppose, comforting our skin and playing stuff and thinking, you know what? We like it. That's the whole point. We liked it when we started the van. That's why we did it when no one wanted to hear us. And now I suppose it's a little bit like being kind of selfish it's our thing. It's our band. We like it. We'll take that box first and then we'll review it a later date and move it forward, you know. <laughs> I just think it's interesting, like the fact that you say you perhaps didn't fit in any mold or people didn't want to hear you. But during the early days of your success, you rode this kind of cool wave where you could kind of go and play to thousands of heavy metal fans at Castle Donington. Then the following weekend or something, you could be on the bill at Reading Festival, still with rock acts, but more indie or alternative. So you've got this kind of really sweet crossover appeal, which hit the nail back then really we've played with everyone from rem to napalm death on the same bill you know and it's that works for me i love both those bands you know what's why wouldn't you you be able to go and enjoy both of them and us you know what i mean so it's it is healthy but i, I do also understand and I, I know why some people like it's like i mentioned acdc earlier you know the new acdc album is brilliant i think because it's exactly what i want from an acdc album yeah but there's no point in me trying to copy that formula because they've got it and it's same with their moans bad religion motorhead they've got their own thing going on and we're not one of those uh, it's just a disservice to call them formula bands but there's a very the template's quite rigid obviously they, they can push it different ways and it's that's when i like when they do stuff like that but we're just not one of those bands i know which is as i say some people it's a real strength for us at times and sometimes it's a bit like oh god what therapy are we going to get today how did the usa respond to the band it was really good i think we, we had that classic they always seem to be a little bit behind i mean the record label not the listener but the record label always seemed to be a bit behind what was going on in in the uk and europe which was moving really quickly because if you imagine nurse came out in september 1992 which is quite a dry industrial sounding album not particularly grunge which would have been the logical thing to do and literally as soon as that came out in the states which i think was january 92 scream edger came out in march sorry 93 so nurse hadn't even been out six months and we already had a top 10 melodic poppy punky type song i think one of the one of the comments from the nm in the states was what is this what is this he says i, I think the phrase was because they said they were basically trying to market us as like a Nine Inch Nails type thing. And they're going, people want to hear glass being gargled. They don't want to hear this. So I think literally as soon as they'd kind of done that, we'd come out with Scream Edger and then it was all on to the Trouble Gum thing. So they were always playing catch up out there. And I think in America, that made people a bit suspicious of us. They're a bit like, well, they were industrial. What, what, what they, what's this now? Do you know what I mean? And I think it wasn't really... I suppose the quirky nature or the the ever-changing kind of approach to the band maybe just wasn't articulated very well to them. Like the, sh- the shows were great. We toured, did a lot of turn out there. Rollins Band, King's X, Jesus Lizard, Helmet. Always went down really great. Did shows the Screaming Trees. Did a big tour with Swerve Driver. A lot of shows with Aussie, actually. Oh, very cool. Aussie and Filter. So we, we did a lot of turn there. And the shows were always great. We did our own shows as well. They were club shows, you know, 250, 500. Maybe the biggest show might have been about 1,000. You know, stuff like that. So it was it was all going well. But I think for, you know, see, it's the old story. I think Soundgarden and Monster Magnet were probably an easier sell for the label because it was a bit more, I suppose, classic rock. Which sounds weird to say now, really. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? But... You know, you can, you know, you hear your black hole song back to back with more than a feeling on American rock yeah. radio. And it, it does kind of work, you know, Monster Magnet had that driving heads down riff rock. You know, they looked like menacing hell's angels as well, which always <laughs> helped. And then you kind of us who were a bit more, I suppose, all over the shop influence and image wise as well. I remember the yeah, another classic American label story. Andy cut his hair quite short. He had like long hair right down here. Cut his hair short. We went over in 93 and they were not happy. Wow. We're a bit like, the hair doesn't play the riffs. You know what I mean? But that's, that's it was a different mindset that we hadn't really bargained for. Have you ever read the story of, you know, the guy Dan Reed? Yes, yeah, yeah. He used to have super long hair. John Bon Jovi was a big fan of him and stuff like that. And the record label was investing millions of dollars into him. And like the night before they were due to shoot a big budget video, he just 
just shaved his head. <laughs> and they weren't happy with that one little bit. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. And do you know what? People say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all about your music. It does. It's a sad thing. And do you know what? I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. When I pay my ticket to go and see Lemmy, I don't want Lemmy to have cut his hair the night before. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right. You know, you have that. It's kind of, I suppose, it's, it's nearly part of the agreement when you yeah. invest in an artist. There's that. But, you know, it's that's maybe more of a 16-year-old mentality yeah. of mine. You know, I'm a bit more whatever. You know, life's too short. Of course, it's about the music. But I think things like that, yeah, they don't, you know, we, we, we could be contrary with label stuff like that. And, and you know, NM in the UK were great because they rolled with the punches and the European labels were great. And I was just thinking about this the other day. It was really bizarre because at the time we were coming up, I suppose maybe 92 to maybe 95, 96, that big kind of commercial success. A lot of people forget that MTV was just one entity. Mm -hmm. So when your video got played and people watched it in France, they also watched it in Austria and in Scandinavia and wherever they get it. And then all kind of fractured after that. So that was a big, you know, you shouldn't ever underplay the the, the power of that because it's, I got into Motorhead because I saw them on top of the pops. You know, I didn't get slipped a Motorhead demo when they got formed because I was so cool. I watched it on mainstream TV. Mm -hmm. And probably spoke about it the next day at school. Yeah, yeah, totally. That would be the the talking point. Where can I get more of this this Motorhead I hear they talk of? You have those kind of things. And I think for us, it's actually amazing because you still... People still come up and say the first time I saw you was an MTV Most Wanted type thing yeah. or I saw the Scream Major video in 120 minutes and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, wow, okay. So that's that's kind of, the, I suppose, the good side of being on a label like that, you know, that can take your crazy idea of a song or whatever and get it over and have people in Austria going, these guys look great. Can't wait to go and see them. And, you know, things like that, you know, at the time, you know, we literally every six months, the show sizes would have doubled and you're doing tours and things. So it was... It was really a lot of different factors come into play. So I kind of bring things to a close. You mentioned right at the beginning, you pretty much moved back close to where you grew up. How is it kind of revisiting your hometown these days? Has it changed a lot? I actually live in the town now, you know, and it's obviously probably like a lot of northern towns. You know, it's maybe a bit tatty and a bit on love, but, you know, I've got a lot, lot of good friends here. It's lovely, um, a lovely part of the world. You know, the nature is quite incredible. We're right beside the sea. There's hills and mountains up there, giants causeways up the road and stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of, you know, Belfast 30 minutes away. It's it's actually quite, um, it suits my mindset. Yeah. I lived in Belfast and London and then in, in Brussels and then in Antwerp for a few years and stuff. And you, you kind of get burnt out of that, especially when you, you get young children as well. I think you kind of, you want the space and the just be able to take things a bit calmer, you know. And, and it's been interesting because I quite like that the touring is nearly the polar opposite of my life at home. And I really enjoy that. Just hit that reset button. It's re- it's brilliant. Obviously, you know, I could I could, <laughs> could gladly do with a little bit more touring at the minute. But <laughs> there is always a danger when you're, I suppose, a, young, a younger man and you come off tour and then you kind of live your life at home like you're still in tour. Yeah. It's not really sustainable physically or mentally. You know, we've all tried it, I'm sure. <laughs> My wife doesn't want to speak to me for about two weeks when I get back from doing some shows. You need to go into that decompression area. Yeah, I don't think I do anything different, but she just hates me for about two weeks. <laughs> you get um, about nine o'clock, you start pacing the living room, getting really <laughs> yeah, stretching <I> out. <laughs> maybe. I, I must just give off some weird vibes. I don't know. No, no I think he, he, I've definitely got a lot better at managing that over the years. And it's good, you know, obviously my parents are here and stuff, you know, they're a bit older as well. So, you know, there's a there's an element of, of stuff there. But it's, it, it is good, you know, and I think, as I say, about focusing on the positives, you know, with the, the whole COVID thing and, and the lockdown and stuff it's it's really refocused my energies on what what's actually important and it's health friends family and doing what you love and in this instance it's music you know I've, I've definitely become a lot more excited about listening to going back and listening to old stuff but also listening to new stuff and been kind of writing new stuff ourselves remotely the band between ourselves which is a new experience you know and it's it's actually going pretty good you know we've got a ton of good stuff i think so it's it's quite exciting and that spend more time with the family and just realizing that you know what why would you get bent out of shape over these small things and we've been so lucky thankfully you know everyone's healthy and well over here at the minute i know other people haven't been so lucky and it's it, it's tragic you know it's, it's it is an incredible tragedy and we'll, we'll, we'll mourn the situation and those people for a long time 
time, but it, it's definitely given me a good kind of, yeah, a wee reset, as you say. Yeah. Got to be a whole different playing field, I think, when we come out of this creatively for people, I think. I don't think people will revert back to how we did. So it might be interesting to see what happens for sure. Yeah, definitely learned a few things and kind of relearned a few things as well or, or kind of, and I appreciate just those little simple things that you sometimes take for granted and stuff, you know, so I'm kind of, very you know it's good i'm glad we're into 2021 now i know it's not been a great start but i think feeling a wee bit more positive you know moving forward this year we'll see some stuff move forward for for you know just not not even in a even for music or whatever just for just life in general you know and seizing the day a little bit more which would be nice michael i'll let you go but thank you for chatting with me no problem mate. i thoroughly enjoyed rob thank you mate Many thanks to Michael McKeegan for taking the time to talk to me here on the Straight to Video podcast. Really cool guy and hopefully he and the band can get out on the road soon to tour and celebrate the band's recent 30th anniversary. They have some rescheduled dates penciled in later this year so fingers crossed those will happen and for all updates then visit therapyquestionmark.co.uk And also please stop by the new Straight to Video website which you can find at stvpod.com where we have all the previous episodes, links to Straight to Video music and videos and you can also pick up the new Straight to Video t-shirt. Once again that is stvpod.com. Also whilst I've got you please check out my new fundraising campaign for Blind Dog Rescue UK which you can find on Facebook by searching Laney's Togs for Dogs where I'm selling off my old band t-shirts for just a fiver each with the proceeds going to help Blind Dog Rescue UK. Thanks to everyone who's already picked up a shirt there's still a bunch more to choose from. As always thanks for choosing to listen to the Straight to Video podcast really does mean a lot and I love that you're enjoying these chats. I know it's a reoccurring statement, but I really do have some more fun ones coming up over the next few weeks. So make sure to like, follow and subscribe on your favourite podcast platform so you don't miss an episode. And also, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts and I'll feature my favourites on the Straight to Video website homepage. So until I speak to you all again, thanks for being awesome. Make sure to stay awesome and I'll speak to you all again real soon. (laughs) 